began a series in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're still continuing through this book, but we are going to begin a three-part series on spiritual gifts because that's what Paul talks about in chapters 12 through 14. And before we dive into this chapter, I want to set the stage a little bit like we did several weeks ago um, in 1 Corinthians 10. We set the stage understanding why God gave us the Old Testament why he gave us the sacrifices back then and what it meant, how it was a foreshadowing of Jesus coming. It was never meant to to purify and take care of sin for the people, but to paint a picture, kind of like a dress rehearsal of what Jesus would come to do. And this morning, as we begin this discussion of spiritual gifts, I think it's very important for us to take a look and to remind ourselves about who the Holy Spirit is. Because spiritual gifts are just that, they're spiritual. They're from him. They're not from us. They're not natural abilities. They're not just natural talents. They're something from the Lord. And so if you would uh, open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 1 with me, you can stick your notes there in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to look at several of these passages on who the Holy Spirit is. Because the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's a person. He's a member of the Trinity. And spirituality as a Christian is not about ritual but it's about personal transformation by the power of a resurrected Christ. Pardon me. And the other thing that's very important to note is the Holy Spirit never possesses people. He empowers people. We see throughout the Bible that it's demonic activity that does the possessing, but our God doesn't do that. He's a gentleman and he empowers us, but he does not possess us. He calls us to willingly yield and follow him. So in Genesis chapter 1, if you look in verse 2, we see the first reference to the Holy Spirit in the very beginning of the Bible. It says this, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And if you jump down to verse 26, we read this statement, And then God said, Let us, The very first reference to the Trinity. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the cattle and all the creeping things that creep on the earth. We see that God created man in his own image. He created us to be unlike the animals, to rule over the animals. That's why human life has much more value than animal life. And yet we live in a day where you will spend more time in prison for abusing a puppy than abusing a little child. But God tells us that people are so important. We are created in his image. We reflect him. We rule over creation. And just as God is is three in one, in a sense, humanity is, is kind of the same thing. We are body, soul, and spirit. If we flip over to John chapter 14... We see Jesus begin, in in chapters 14 through 16, a discussion, perhaps the clearest discussion in all the Bible, of who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. So let's highlight a few verses in these chapters to understand a little bit more about the Holy Spirit. In chapter 14 of John, the Gospel of John, find verses 14 through, excuse me, 16 through 17, if you will, with me. And we see Jesus here talk about how it's better that he was going to ascend and go to heaven because then the Holy Spirit could come. So let's look at 16 and 17. Jesus says, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. We see that Jesus said it was better that he would ascend to the Father so the Holy Spirit could come. Because when Jesus walked on this earth, he was limited in the sense that he was fully God and fully man. His his bodily presence was limited in the sense that he could only be at one place at one time. But he said it was better for us that he would leave because then the Holy Spirit would come and the Holy Spirit would indwell every single believer. We have direct access to the throne room of God. And we can pray to him and we can be guided by him at any time. Because the Bible says in the New Testament that no longer does God dwell over the Ark of the Covenant in one temple in Jerusalem. But now he makes his temple the home of every single believer. And over in Romans chapter 8 verse 9, 
Paul tells us that whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ is not Christ. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we are not a Christian. Paul makes this statement over in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, and it echoes what Jesus says here in John chapter 14, where he says the Spirit of truth the world cannot receive. The world does not see the Holy Spirit, does not understand how he works, and does not know him. But we as believers not only know him, and he not only dwells with us, but he indwells us. He lives within us as believers. And so we see Jesus make this incredible promise. As we go on in chapter 14 of John, we come to verse 26, and Jesus makes another statement about the Holy Spirit and how he ministers to us. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to teach us. But he doesn't teach us things that aren't in the Scripture. He brings to our remembrance what Christ has said. Have you ever had a time in your life, we were talking about this, I think, some in Sunday school, where the Lord brings to our remembrance the Scripture right when we need it. He reminds us of how he's been at work in our life. And so the Holy Spirit teaches us the Word of God, and he reminds us when we need to be reminded on what Jesus has said. This is one of his functions and blessings. He is our helper in that sense. And that Greek word for helper is the word paraclete, which literally is the picture in Greek of somebody holding your hand, walking side by side with you. That is the Holy Spirit that has been sent to us as believers. As we jump to chapter 15, we go to verse 26, and we see another thing that Jesus says. He keeps referring to the Holy Spirit as a helper. The Lord is there to help us. Verse 26 of chapter 15 says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from me, he will testify of me. Another very important truth about the Holy Spirit is he always, always exalts Jesus. He never brings attention to himself, the scripture is going to say, but he testifies of Christ. This is something that we'll see in a couple weeks when we get into chapter 14, as Paul's discussing the spiritual gifts. It is so, so important. The Holy Spirit always exalts Jesus. He does not exalt himself. We then get to chapter 16 as Jesus continues this discussion. And we come to verses 7 through 11, and Jesus says this, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 16 of John. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you, and when he has come, notice three things here, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world stands judged. There's three ways the Holy Spirit works, that he ministers in our lives. He convicts the world of sin. How many of you know you can share the truth with somebody, but you can't convict somebody? I wish I could convict people. I think we all wish that at times, to help them see the truth. But the reality is the Holy Spirit must be at work. He must draw them to himself. And Jesus says over in John chapter 3 that he was raised up on the cross, just like the serpent way back in the Old Testament was raised up on that stick, and that whoever would look in faith to the Lord would be saved. When Jesus was raised up on that cross, he says, I will draw all people to myself. And it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Trinity that draws us to him. So the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, convicts the lost of sin, but also the believer. He also instructs us in righteousness, the right way to live and glorify Christ. Jesus spent a lot of his ministry in the Gospels instructing the the disciples on what was right and how to serve the Lord. Well, now the Holy Spirit does that personally for every single one of us. What a privilege that is. And also the Holy Spirit convicts us and reminds us of judgment. That the ruler of this world stands judged. Satan and his authority and his rule has come to an end because of what Jesus did on that cross. Amen. Now the coming judgment for the Christian is a time that we look forward to because it will be the end of our trials and tribulations on this earth. We'll be reunited with the Lord. 
But the judgment is also a time when we should have a sense of trembling because we will give an account for how we have lived this life before Jesus Christ. However, for the unbeliever, I can only imagine what that judgment day will be. The Bible says that every single knee will bow one day before Jesus. For we who serve him, I think we're going to bow in reverence and awe because we love him so much. He's our king and he's coming into his authority in all of its power and glory. But for the unbeliever, you will stand before Jesus in that day out of sheer terror that he is your judge. As one person has described, it may even be like there is a hand on your shoulder pushing you down to your knees in sorrow about how you have rejected and missed serving the one true God. Really, the Lord sends nobody to hell. Every single one of us choose hell because we choose to reject God's gracious gift of fellowship with him. The Bible says that God loves and desires for every person to come to a knowledge of the truth. He desires for every single person to come to repentance. But our God is a gentleman. He does not force us. He allows us to make that choice, even though it breaks his heart to see someone reject him. We go on in verses 12 through 14 here in John chapter 16, and we see more of what the Holy Spirit does. Jesus says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He was getting ready to go to the cross. The disciples were going to miss a lot of things, and they could not bear him to tell them more. They didn't even understand that he was going to go to the cross, even though he told them time and time again. They didn't understand what that meant. Verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come, and we have that in the Revelation. Verse 14, he will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I have said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Notice that verse 14. The Holy Spirit does not draw attention to himself. He puts the spotlight on Jesus. He glorifies Christ. He teaches us of the truth of the Lord so that we can follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where we were earlier, we're going to open this up and we'll read this together in just a moment. And there's a couple other verses there listed in your notes about the Holy Spirit and how he ministers to us. They're in parentheses that you can perhaps look at this week in your time with the Lord and see just what a gift the Holy Spirit is to us. But if you're there in 1 Corinthians 12 with me, if you would stand, we're going to read this passage and then we're, we're going to go through rather quickly. I know we have a lot of ground to cover this morning. But let's read this passage together and see what the Lord says about spiritual gifts. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gift of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not part of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smell? And are not as special members, each 
one of them in the body is to be great. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Verse 20. But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Neither can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater honesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given the greater honor to the part that lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, the members individually, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, the gifts of healing, health, administration, variety of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all serve? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will say more excellently. Father, as we walk through this passage very briefly this morning, I pray that you would continue to speak to us as you always do by your word. Open our hearts, Father. Show us how we have been called to be a part of your body. Father, encourage us where there needs to be encouragement. Father, convict us where there needs to be conviction. And in all things, help us to honor and glorify you and to obey you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. The first thing that we see this morning in the, in the first three verses is that spiritual gifts of God are different than spiritual practices of paganism. And so you'll, you'll find those blanks in your notes. Spiritual gifts of God are different than spiritual practices of paganism. Paul talks about how God has given spiritual gifts. They're not natural ability. They're not something that someone was to just try to, to mimic or do in their own strength. They were from God, from the Spirit. However, Paul makes a distinction that back before being Christians, that so many of the now believers here had practiced many spiritual practices of paganism. But Paul wants to make it very clear, this is not a discussion of some type of Christianized uh, pagan spirituality, but rather it is completely distinct how God works among his people. We see that as we go on to verses 4 through 6 where we see this. We see the Holy Spirit empowers, he does not possess, the Holy Spirit empowers a variety of giftings, ministries, and activities. Paul talks about how there's a variety of ministries and activities and giftings within the church. There's many different things that we can do and bring honor and glory to Christ. However, the part that really matters is that the Holy Spirit is at work and guiding us through every single thing. Whether we are doing a trunk or treat, whether we're praying, whether we're in Sunday school, whether we're worshiping in a worship service, anything and everything we do as the body of Christ is meant to be infused and guided by the Holy Spirit. For without the Spirit, we can do absolutely nothing. Jesus says over in John chapter 15 that apart from Him, we can do nothing. Think about that. We can do absolutely nothing without Jesus Christ, without his spirit at work among us. As we go on to verses 7 through 11 here, Paul makes a statement, particularly in verse 7, that I want to zero in on. He says, But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And so if you look at your notes, you can fill in the blanks, and it's this. Manifestations of the Holy Spirit are for edifying, or for edification. Manifestations of the Holy Spirit are for edifying. Or you could put edification as well. The whole point of the Holy Spirit working through the body and using us is this word that we've seen numerous times before in 1 Corinthians, which is that God's design for the church is that everything we do be for the good of building up the body, that it would be edifying. This was not for there to be certain types of giftings that got more of a slice of the pie, if you will, or more of a show. We're going to get into that in a few weeks where Corinth got off track in idolizing certain gifts rather than recognizing what really mattered was the Lord at work. But we see Paul here in verses 7 through 11 
mention a lot of different types of spiritual gifts. And sometimes people try to define all these and explain what they mean and what they don't mean. And I think that sometimes when we do that, we can get in danger of missing the point. If you jump down to verse 11, at the ending of listing all these different spiritual gifts, look at what Paul says. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So who picks our spiritual gifts? Well, the Lord does. It's the Holy Spirit who gives these spiritual gifts to his body for the sake of edification, we see up in verse 7. And there's different types. Now, I can't claim to ex understand and explain away what all of these gifts mean. For example, miracles. I don't know how miracles take place. But I know that our God still works miracles. Amen. I know he still answers prayer. I think sometimes we can get in danger of putting the Lord in a box. And the truth is, he never fit in a box and he's never going to fit in a box. Now there certainly are ways in which some of these giftings can be perverted, can be made into something they were not intended to be. And again, we'll address a few of those things in a few weeks when we get to chapter 14. But whatever spiritual gifts that the Lord decides to use within the body, what really matters is they are always for edification, they're never for confusion, they're never for division, and they are empowered by the Spirit. So whenever the Holy Spirit shows up and shows off, whether through someone's testimony, whether through someone's teaching, whether through someone's service, it is always for the purpose of edifying the body. It's never for the purpose of dividing the body. In verses 12 through 14, we come to the next point, which is there are, is one body, but many parts. One body, many parts there in your notes. In verses 12 through 14, Paul uses the illustration of a literal body. That we have different parts of our body. We have hands, we have eyes, we have ears. And he uses that to illustrate to us two objections that many times come up when you begin to speak of spiritual gifts. I like the way the New King James um, renders body parts. It says that the body is not one member, but many. That each part of the body is a member. It's connected and each one individually matters. I like that word because as a church, we are to be church members, are we not? We're not just part of a church in some type of organizational sense or some type of being on a list of names like a roster. We are to be a member. We are part of this family. We are part of this unified one body that God has designed. And he's called us to be united as one, not in a philosophical sense of having the same vision, but to literally be one family pursuing Christ. But Paul mentions two objections that many times there are when you begin to talk about spiritual gifts. The first objection is, and I'm not trying to trick you here, but that blank in that first uh, objection is meant to stay blank. So you don't have to write anything there. The first objection Paul mentions is, I'm not like blank, so I don't belong. You see him illustrate here that, well, I'm not an eye, so I don't matter. Or I'm not a mouth, so I don't matter. Sometimes we are tempted to place greater value on certain gifts rather than others. But the truth is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No one gift is better than another. The gift of teaching or preaching is not better than a gift of service. This is not about some type of hierarchy or better importance. They simply function differently. But Paul then begins to talk about how we need the parts of the body that sometimes we see less. And that's the second objection that Paul talks about here. We don't need you. We don't need you. We see that illustrated in the text, where one part says, well, I'm not this, and so I, I, I don't matter. Or you're not this, so we don't need you. We have to be so careful about that. Look at verse 22. The Word of God says, that rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are more necessary, and those members of the body which we think less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. The Lord Jesus says that the so-called weaker parts of the body are actually more important than, if you will, the stronger parts. I think we were kind of talking about that a little bit in, in Sunday school this morning. But how sometimes, as we talked about confidence, we know that sometimes there are those who, who lack confidence in the body. 
But did you know that the very fact that maybe someone struggles with faith or confidence more than someone else is actually an enormous blessing? Because it's an opportunity for us as a body to practice what Jesus did, to encourage others, to edify others, to encourage them to remember who God is. It's an opportunity for the Lord to help us to develop the character of Christ. Because while spiritual gifts are important, spiritual fruit, the, the fruit of the Spirit, are really what's most important. And we'll get into that next week when we get to chapter 13, which was not really meant to be a chapter to read at weddings, although there's nothing wrong with that. It really is in the context of talking about spiritual gifts and about the body is why God gave us chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians and how important spiritual fruit matters even more than spiritual gifting. But the parts of the body that we think are weaker or unnecessary or perhaps not seen as much are needed more. So, so go back to school and, and think about this for a moment. The parts of our body, our hands, our eyes, our mouth that we see and that are, if you will, more prominent um, as our body moves and operates. However, there are a lot of parts of the body at work that you can't see. How many organs do we have? If you didn't have a heart, if you didn't have a liver, you didn't have a pancreas, you certainly would not be healthy, would you? You wouldn't even be alive in many cases if you didn't have these different organs. In the same way, there are many parts of the body of Christ that, that we don't ever see, or we don't see necessarily they're working as much. What about the one that has been gifted by the Lord to labor much in prayer and intercession? That is not a cop-out type of spiritual gift. Well, I'll pray about that. No, the person that truly devotes himself to prayer and is called to intercede for the body of Christ is an enormously important gift. Billy Graham, many of you probably know that name, but did you know that Billy Graham really did not credit his ministry success to his ability. You know, he preached, he had passion, that was important. But what Billy Graham had behind him was an enormous, enormous body of people praying for him. And there were many partners in his ministry. He may have been the one that God was using to share the message, but there were countless other believers that were partnered in the same work through prayer. Before he would go to a city, it wasn't just a, a one-man show of go and preach a crusade, before he would go, months in advance, members of his team would go, and they would train local churches, and local churches would go out, and they would invite many people to come and be part of the rallies, and the local churches would be trained to disciple those who would place their faith and trust in Jesus at the crusade, because Billy Graham would be moving on, but they had a process in place where those who trusted in Christ would be followed up with and become part of local churches right there. It, he was not a one-man show, even though the Lord used him mightily. He was just one part. He may be the more visible part, but Billy Graham would have been nothing if there was not prayer support behind him. I can absolutely guarantee that. He would not have been anything if there was not other local churches involved in that ministry. It was the same way with Charles Spurgeon in the 1800s. He was known as the Prince of Preachers. He was still widely read even to this day. He was a Baptist and preaching in London. There were so many um, non-Christians coming to hear him preach that he had to beg the church, had to beg the Christians not to come to church so there'd be room. God was moving so mightily. But once again, it was the power of prayer. There were a couple hundred men that while Spurgeon would preach, would go down, I believe it was the church basement, and they'd be praying for him the entire time. It wasn't about Spurgeon's ability to preach. It wasn't about Billy Graham's ability to preach. It was about a body of Christ united and in sync with the Lord's will, praying for him to be magnified, for the lost to be drawn to Christ, and for those who believed to become truly part of the family. I don't know how we can live the Christian life alone. We can't. God never intended for us to walk an aisle, say a prayer, and then never be part of the family. Now, there's many reasons why people are not part of churches. Sometimes I've gone into and had the, the privilege and responsibility of going somewhere where it's, it's been, sadly, a, a divisive situation. 
And it, it's a sad thing when you walk into a church that does not understand just how much they've heard the testimony of the gospel. I remember one time I was serving with a church and got to know the community. I got to go out, got to meet people and, and invite them to church and found out there were a number of people in that community that had been hurt in the past and would go to no church because of the reputation of this particular local church. It's a sad thing when Satan gets the upper hand and the flesh gets the upper hand and that's the reputation. But that's not the picture that God has for us. It's not his desire for us. His desire and his will is for us to be part of one body. Now, a body is never going to be perfect. And a body is, is never going to be perfectly protected from conflict. Conflict is not really a bad thing if we process it the right way. We all know throughout life we don't always agree with other people. Isn't that true? But it matters how we process and how we walk through in a Christ-like way or in a fleshly way when we don't agree. The church will never be perfect. And there are those who make the excuse that they will not be part of the body, they will not be part of a local church, because that's made up of hypocrites and that's made up of people that just rub them the wrong way. And my response usually to that is, well, if the church is full of hypocrites, we'd love one more. Come join us. Because it's the truth. None of us are ever going to be perfect. None of us will ever live a perfect life for Christ. But that is to be the aim. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I remember my pastor's wife several years ago uh, making the statement that sadly it seems sometimes in the modern, uh, the modern church in our country, we have a tendency to lower the bar, lower the bar, lower the bar for what it means to follow Jesus. When biblically we should be raising the bar to live like Christ. We can't lower the bar even though God in his grace and mercy forgives whatever our past and however far uh, gone we have drifted, he can still bring us back and restore us. That's the God that we serve. But it's not an excuse to do it on our own and to live apart from him. We need the body. If a member of the body is not present, the body may still live, but the body suffers. If you don't have your appendix, you may be alive, but you may not be able to fight infection as well you don't have a pancreas, you don't have a spleen or these different parts of the body, you may be alive, but you're not functioning the way the Lord intended. Or if you don't have one arm, you may still be able to function, but you can't function the way the Lord intended. Every single member, as insignificant as maybe at times our flesh may think someone is, every single member matters to God. Every single matters to God. And perhaps we think ourselves not important because we don't have a certain gift that maybe we think is really, really important. Brothers and sisters, every single part matters. Here's really the only thing that matters. Are we obedient to God? When he calls us and he gifts us, it's for the purpose of building up his body. It's not for our own glory. Just as the Holy Spirit we saw over there in John was sent to glorify and exalt Jesus so in the same way, the Holy Spirit working through Christ's people as he indwells us and empowers us as we yield to him in obedience, we are to exalt Christ and not ourselves. Every member of the body matters, and the weaker are actually more necessary. In God's economy, many times there are contradictions and supposed paradoxes that turn things on their head and show us what's really important. Paul will speak when we get in 2 Corinthians several months from now. Paul will speak about how it is a good thing that he is weak. Because he said, when I was weak, I finally learned that Christ is strong. When we are insufficient and we are at our end and we are unable to do any more, that is when the Lord's power many times shows up and shows off in the most glorious way. You probably have testimonies. You can think of times in your life when you've done something afraid in obedience to the Lord and you did not feel that you did the best and yet the Lord showed up and showed off. Why? Because it's all about Him. It's not about us. He can use us even when we feel that we are not able to do what He's calling us to do. And then lastly this morning in your notes, we come to 
something that we are prone to ask sometimes. The Corinthian church was asking this. This question that we're going to see, and it's this. What's my rank in parentheses? And essentially what Paul does is he's, he's answering this question of, okay, here you go. What, here's the rank, if you will, the pecking order in the church. But there's something more important. There's something more important than what your quote-unquote rank is in the body of Christ. And so in verse 28, I'll try to just real quickly describe what he's talking about here. Paul says that God has appointed certain things in the church. There's a certain order to things in a local church. The first is, is the apostles. Now, we don't have apostles today in the way we did in the first century. And if anybody says they're an apostle, I would probably encourage you to walk on down the road and not listen to what they're going to say next. But the gift of apostle, I, I would say biblically, is, is still in operation. And here, here's what I mean. The word apostale in Greek simply meant sent one or one sent on a mission. We have a different word today, but we still have missionaries, don't we? And missionaries go, and what's their purpose? Not to just preach the gospel, but the role and purpose of a missionary is to establish a local church. Because the local church is God's method and God's way of continuing ministry until Jesus comes. Particular ministries and, and parachurch organizations and evangelistic initiatives, those things have a purpose and praise the Lord for them, but they will one day pass away. The church will endure until Jesus comes and will endure into when Jesus reigns. And so God certainly still uses missionaries. They're, if you will, the first ones that help begin the church. And then it says there's second prophets. Now, sometimes people look at prophets and they think there certainly can't be prophets today. And, and I'd agree with you that if somebody's saying they're a prophet, once again, probably walk on down the road from what they're going to be saying. But the gift of prophecy is a spiritual gift, and we'll get into it in a couple weeks in chapter 14, that really is better understood as preaching. And what did the Old Testament prophets do in the Old Testament most of the time? They didn't foretell the future very much. We have a tendency to think of prophecy and think, oh, that must mean foretelling the future. What the prophets actually did most of the time is foretell, F-O-R-T-H. They told forth the word of God. They called nations and they called God's people to repent and they heralded forth and prepared the way for the Lord. What did John the Baptist do? Jesus said that he was the, the last of the Old Testament prophets and the greatest of them. He prepared the way for Jesus. He said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He heralded and preached, if you will, encouraging repentance. And certainly the Lord still raises up those who proclaim that message, both to the body of the Lord for judgment begins with the house of God, but also to the lost and dying world. Then, of course, teachers, and I think we understand that, and then miracles and gifts of healing. We don't understand these things, but we do know that the Lord does still miraculously heal and praise the Lord for it. In the New Testament book of Acts, I think there's a very important distinction for us to draw as we think about this and this spiritual gifting. Never in the New Testament did they have what sometimes we see today being healing crusades, that thing that's advertised by some churches today and some ministries and ministers were never, ever practiced in the Bible. We don't see that. We never saw that advertised. What happened is the Lord worked, and when he would do miracles, it was always for the purpose of glorifying Christ. And, and also we see this pattern. Many times in the book of Acts and in Jesus' ministry, when many miracles took place, they took place to confirm the work of God in a missionary situation. And if you read stories about missionaries, you'll still, even to this day, hear many stories about how God has miraculously answered prayer. When missionaries are going into a place that has not received the gospel, perhaps there's a lot of witch doctors and false demonic activity and voodoo and such. And in the midst of that, as the gospel is being preached and as God's people are praying for those who are sick, God has answered many prayers. And we see that pattern throughout Acts. We see that pattern through missionaries today. It's hard for us, again, to understand how all this works. I don't think we're supposed to understand it. We're simply to recognize that when the Lord heals, it's for his glory. Amen. And ultimately, ultimately, we do know this. For the believer, every believer will ultimately experience healing. Maybe not in this life. But when we get to heaven, no more tears. 
No more suffering. No more trial. Our Lord Jesus will ultimately heal all of those things. Maybe not on this earth. We pray according to his will. We praise him when he miraculously works. And we trust him that he knows when and where those things need to take place, even if we don't understand it. We then see the gift of helps and the gift of administration. Helping within the body is important. Administration is important. You know, administration is one of those spiritual giftings that uh, you may not know who has that gift, but you definitely can tell if that gift is not present. If there's nothing happening administratively, usually it's very apparent in the way that things go. And then it says varieties of tongues, and that one is probably the most controversial in our day. I would say this, however, in the original language that Paul is speaking in. That word tongues does not mean what we think of today when we hear that term. It, it literally back then just simply meant language, another language. When missionaries go to foreign fields, they have to take the gospel many times to people that do not understand the language that they speak. There's this language barrier. And there is this gift that the Lord gives to be able to cross those boundaries to take the gospel. We'll dive into that in a few weeks because the Corinthians misunderstood it. And actually the Corinthians misunderstood this gift in the same way it's misunderstood today. And so Paul ends this passage with saying, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? He says, do we all look the same way? Do we all have the same gift? No. But verse 31 is so, so critical for us to land. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. Paul talks about the fact that, yes, there are different gifts. Yes, there is, if you will, some type of, quote-unquote, rank in how the Lord many times works in that manner. However, what matters more is the most excellent way. And that is not that we have a wide variety of gifts and giftings, but that we have the love of God in our hearts and for one another. And that's what we're going to dive in next week in chapter 13. So as we land, so to speak, the plane, a couple of questions to ask ourselves. What spiritual gift or gifts do you have? The Lord has given every believer at least one gift. Sometimes he gives multiple gifts. And the question is, how are we serving the body with them? A spiritual gift is given for the edification of the body of Christ. It's not really given for the benefit of the lost. That's kind of interesting. The purpose of the church is not to gather and to focus on evangelism. As much as we continue to uplift Jesus, we preach the gospel, we proclaim the gospel every time that we gather together, the purpose of the church in the Bible is not gathering together for the purpose of evangelism. The church scatters for evangelism. The church does evangelism. But that's part of the reason why we see, at times, this this missing the mark within our world today and our, our country today in so many churches that have focused on trying to gear everything on a Sunday morning toward the lost rather than the saints. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm not saying. I, I'm not saying we don't preach the gospel. But what I'm saying is this. Scripturally, the church is only the body of Christ. It's only the body of Christ. And we gather together to encourage and edify one another, to worship the Lord, to serve him. Yes, to share the gospel. But our primary purpose as the body of Christ gathering is to worship and serve the Lord. That's the primary reason that we gather. So how are you serving the Lord with your spiritual gifts? Two things in your notes, if you look there, that are helpful as we think through this. It's the Lord that gives spiritual gifts, and the Lord is the one that confirms them. He gives them. But spiritual gifts are also affirmed by the church. This is to help us to keep from, from getting off track. If we think we have a certain spiritual gift, but our church body lovingly says, no, that's, that's not really edifying the body when we, we try and do that. For example, every single Christian is called to teach Jesus says that we are to make disciples of all nations. We're all called, every single believer, to make disciples. However, we certainly understand that not everybody has the gift of teaching. There's a difference there. We're all called to teach, if you will, in a mentorship capacity, but we're all 
not gifted perhaps to teach in a, a uh, teaching capacity or a classroom. And that's okay. A spiritual gift is given and confirmed by God, but then it is affirmed by the church. The church recognizes that God is at work here, and there is an edification, and there is an encouragement in that gifting for the body. So we have looked at a lot this morning very quickly at spiritual gifts. We see there's many different types of spiritual gifts. We see the Holy Spirit is the one that's at work. We see it's all about exalting Jesus. Every single time throughout the Bible, whether God did a miracle, whether the gospel was preached, it was always Jesus that was exalted and glorified. And that is still the same grid for us today to understand the purpose of spiritual gifts. At the same time, Paul reminds us that there is a more excellent way. More important than our giftedness or the variety of gifts present in a body, the most important thing is our spiritual fruit, the fruits of the Spirit. And next week we'll, we'll dive into that. So join me in prayer today. Father, as we, as we have opened up your word, and we have looked at 1 Corinthians 12, Lord, where Paul says some stuff that may make us a little uncomfortable, as he continues this discussion, Lord, there are things that we don't completely understand. Father, we don't understand your will many times. We pray but, Father, sometimes your answer is no, or sometimes, Father, your answer is wait. But we know that your will is what matters. And as a church body, as we continue to walk through the spiritual gifts that you have given, and the unifying most important thing about the love of God being present in our hearts and in our body, as we'll see next week, Father, help us to focus on you. Father, help us to have clarity in how you are calling us to obey you. Help us to simply take a step of obedience and to leave the result in your hands. Father, continue to join us together and to build us together as a body for your glory. Father, for your benefit and your kingdom. Father, as we gather together, help us to continue to encourage one another as the church is meant to do Help us to encourage one another to continue living this life for Jesus and drawing closer to him. And Father, help us as we part from this place every single week to do what the, the Bible says, which is to do evangelism, to scatter from this place, taking the word with us, continuing to be the church even when we are not gathered as the church. Father, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit as believers who works within us to always, always exalt and lift Jesus up. Help us to do so, Father. Draw us to yourself and be with us as we lift our voices in song in just a moment. In Jesus' name we pray.